Hi, my name is Jennifer. This is Metatronis speaking. Today's video is going to be an entire galactic voyage, if you will. It's going to cover all kinds of topics, uh, soul contracts, many, many galactic groups, all kinds of new information that's come through. It's fascinating. It's going to take a while, though. So let me just give you some of the things that I'm going to be covering in this video. I talk to the Pleiadian Council, who I've never talked to before. I talk to the Manted High Council, that I've never talked to before. And I talk to a Golden Manted. I talk to the Whale Collective. I finally talk to a Gray, or a Zeta Reticuli, alien, um, without panicking. Mostly. I did ask Michael to stand next to me, but I was being a chicken at the moment. Uh, <laughs> but not only did I meet this gray, but I made a soul contract with him. I also met a, what I'm going to call for you guys, a hammerhead shark extraterrestrial, which is a group that has attacked me before. This time, instead of having them attack me, I met one that was not, I met one that was aligned with the light. And so I'm going to share that with you. Um, and so I learn about that hammerhead shark race, which is called, they are called Barosians. And yes, I made a soul contract with them too. So you'll see that. So I hope you have something nice to drink. I hope you just feel like chatting for a while because this conversation is going to take a second. So this entire event, this is kind of hilarious, by the way, all this channeling that I did, it was kind of foreshadowed by Metatron while I was, it was, it was story time for my children. Okay. I have two little kids. I have a four-year-old and a six-year-old and we read them stories every night before they go to bed. And the four-year-old gets to pick out the books and, uh, both my kids can read really well. But the four-year-old will still pick out um, alphabet books every once in a while to read for fun. So let me just show you what happened. So I'm reading this book to my kids. And it's, you know, it's silly, right? It's like A is for angelfish, B is for bull shark, whatever. It's a bunch of sea animals based on the letter. And all of a sudden, Metatron starts getting my attention on certain animals. So he starts off with H is for hammerhead shark, like the ETs. Now let me show you which other ones he highlights for me. J is for jellyfish. By the way, I was I was reading, and, and in case I wasn't paying attention, every time I read one of the ones he wanted to talk about, my shoulder was going. O is for octopus. This is like story time right now with all of you guys. S is for seahorse. T is for turtle. I swear I'm not reading this book to you guys. These are the ones that Metatron pointed out to me. You're going to see why. U is for unicorn fish. Okay. And that, oh, it's freaking never ending. W is for whale. So all of those, he's pointing out to me and I'm just like, are you showing me like a bunch of like alien species? And he's like, yeah. So I was like, okay. Mm. So that's going to come into play in this video. Um, and I realized something else and I almost lost my mind when I realized it. So remember how, I don't know, it was a couple weeks ago, I pulled a bunch of Oracle cards for myself, trying to get a reading for myself. And it ended up being a story, um, oh, sorry, it ended up being a past life or, um, or it ended up being someone that I would channel based on each of the cards. And I had three cards and I showed you guys these cards weeks ago in a video just to like prove to you guys that there was going to be a reason for them eventually, even though I didn't know it at the time. Check out these cards. That, and these are the three that I haven't gotten a story for. Oh, look at that. A seahorse. 
a sea turtle. and a jellyfish. So three of the ones he pointed out to me in that book. So in what I'm doing today for you guys, it's going to briefly mention those three groups. Um, there's He still wants to give me information on these three that he hasn't given me yet, but I just want to show you that when your guides point something out to you, it's never just like some random one moment thing. There, it's, there's always a thread. There's always a connection. It's always going to come back to something where all of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, all those pieces fit together. Okay. So, everybody just go ahead and relax. Buckle your seatbelts. It is time to take a tour of the cosmos. So this all started... When I, and this is crazy, it started when I woke up in the morning and I, my, I keep my phone by my bedside and I had reached over and I, I took my phone and I looked at my phone and you know how you have a picture that is kind of saved on your phone. That's your background of your phone. And it's that front screen that you see and mine had been changed. And so instead of what was previously on there, it was now showing me a picture of a crystal grid that we created at at my business at uh, orangelightenergy.com. It was showing the Pleiadian activation grid. Okay, so the phone was way far away from me. I w couldn't accidentally unlock it and like push a bunch of buttons. This was done for me. So if you ever wonder if spiritual beings can interfere with your electronics? The answer is yes. Absolutely. Um, and not just um, not just angels, not just um, your guides, um, departed souls can do things on electronics very easily. Um, my husband has had an experience where a departed soul placed a phone call. I've had an experience where an extraterrestrial that was not a friend placed an outbound call on my phone and they were doing that maliciously because um, they can travel through electronics. They can travel through um, phones and computers and televisions and any, anything with an electronic frequency, they can travel through from one place to another. And so they were trying to move from one place to another. That upset me. Um, so just, throwing this out there in case you guys have ever had an experience like that. So let's see. My dog is like in the corner right now and he thinks it's like time to exit. Come here, boy. Come up here. Come on a bit. Good boy. Thank you. Can you lay down? His name is Rocket. He's black and white and he's super shy. So there will be no camera time with Rock. Hi. Thank you. You're doing so good. Thank you. Okay. So. Da, 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 da. So my phone had its wallpaper changed or its background changed. I didn't do it. So I asked Metatron because I saw it and, then, and I asked him, do the Pleiadians want to talk to me? <laughs> He's like, yes. So I was like, okay. So now just keep in mind that this is like first thing in the morning and I, I'm, I'm not really a morning person. I get up at like five or six every morning, but I need like 30 minutes to become a nice bubbly, happy person. The first 30 minutes, I'm like, don't talk to me. I just need to walk the dog. And like, I just, I just need 30 minutes or an hour to just wake up. Um, but right away, he's like, the Pleiadians want to talk. And right away, I'm like, all right, let's do this. So <laughs> my <laughs> my attitude is a little bit different, a little sassier because I'm tired. It's first thing in the morning. Um, so anyways. So first thing I see is the Pleiadian Council. So there are 12 of them 
and I can see their entire bodies and they're standing at a distance and there's one female, there's one female and one male that are both standing um, more forward. It's the female that ended up communicating with me. I looked at their facial expressions because I don't know. A lot of times when you look at guides, they're like really loving and really, or smiling or something or being silly. I looked at them and they were all serious. And so I said to Metatron, I'm like, I guess this isn't a social visit. Like, as in, I can tell they're, this is a serious topic. Um, so I was like, okay. So the leader, the female, speaks telepathically to me on behalf of all of them. She says, our agreements for this lifetime have all been met. Would you like to discuss entering into another? And she was just all business, which is kind of crazy because the Pleiadians are pretty, uh, everybody likes the Pleiadians. They're very likable. But they are all business when it's the council, apparently. So she said that to me. And in my mind, probably because I'm still waking up, I was thinking, I haven't done anything for the Pleiadians. How could my soul contract be met? Like, I didn't even know what the soul contract was, but I was like, how could it be met? I haven't done anything. And then she shows me the Pleiadian activation service from our business that we use. Um, so she indicated that it has reached individuals that the Pleiadians wanted to be connected to and that there are still many others that it needs to reach, but that they already anticipate those individuals eventually stepping forward. So those of you who have gotten the Pleiadian activation from my website, from my business, thank you so much because you helped Susan and I meet a soul contract. And it was funny, I asked Metatron about it. I was like, well, isn't the soul contract with um with the people who actually get the activation? And he was saying, no, the contract was with the Pleiadians to make this attempt. And then everyone has their own free will, right? So then hopefully it the people who were intended to have this done feel motivated to go get it done, right? Anyways, so thank you. You helped us meet our soul contracts. And Let's see. And if you are thinking about getting it in the future, thank you also, because you're part of that. So she, the Pleiadian, continues. She says they already, and she's referencing the people who are going to get this done in the future. They already know in their hearts they are connected to us. And at the right time for them, they will be moved to act. And so I was like, okay, so that was our soul contract, just like making this activation. And she said, yes. So I asked her, what new soul contracts are you proposing? And I kid you not. So I'm standing at a distance from them, like quite a distance, really. It's kind of strange how much of a distance they were at. It was probably, okay, I'm being told now. They were at a distance because if they, if I had been able to look at all their faces, I would have it would have been distracting because I would have recognized them and it would have triggered feelings and memories. Okay. So they were at like a super distance. So my little blind eyes couldn't see their faces that well. And so I asked her what other soul contracts, what, what other soul contracts is she proposing? And between us, these clear orbs, probably like this big, it looks bigger on when I'm had my hand so close to the camera, probably like the size of a, I don't know, a basketball, a soccer ball. These orbs pop up, seven of them, one at a time. Boom, 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 boom. Seven orbs clear in like a, in like a semicircle around them. And they're hovering in the air. And so she touches the first one, which her right it's my left she touches the first orb and it makes the orb open up and when it opens up it transforms the vision that i'm already in into a different vision and so i see myself in this second vision basically writing a book on the pleiades and I say to myself, why do I want to cry? 
and maybe throw up. And I was talking to myself. I'm like, I'm not scared. I don't have, I'm not scared to write a book. But I also don't have dreams to write a book that's never been like a thing of mine. So why am I having this reaction? And they're telling me they want me to write about my lifetimes there to show what the planet and people are like. And I think to myself, to the best of my memory, I can't recall any lifetimes that they've shown me on the Pleiades. Um, so I, my, my gut reaction is there must be a lot of trauma there that they're like, Hey, write about your lifetimes on the Pleiades. And I'm like, Ooh, I kind of want to cry and throw up <laughs> like that's a bad reaction, but it is what it is. So I must have some sad lifetimes there. The proposed soul contract is for me to write two books that I channel from them. The second book seems to contain special codes for activations. It seems more mystical. I see these like mandala-like designs, but they're activating something within the human. So, of course, I'm interested in that. They know how to show me the things that are fascinating, that make me eager to want to do these things. Um, so I'm like, okay, so I pull out of the vision and I tell them I'll consent. And so they have me stick my hand into the orb just from the wrist down. So I stick my hand into the orb that she had opened and it's like the equivalent of giving a signature and it just kind of closes up the orb and makes it disappear. And so right after I did that, I started getting this really strong feeling that one of the soul contracts involved writing a book from information channeled from the mantids. And I was really confused because I thought all of these soul contracts were with the Pleiadians. And so I like I kind of was panicked and I turned to Metatron and, and I asked him, are these contracts just with the Pleiades? And he said, no. And I'm tired. <laughs> it's early in the morning. And so I cussed. I, I, I used the F word when I'm tired. So I was like, <laughs> because I felt like a little bit of pressure because I was like, oh my God, you're going to bring me a bunch of different groups, aren't you? And they're going to want a bunch of different things. And this is a lot of work and responsibility and stuff. So even though they weren't asking me anything that I already didn't know how to do, and, and I, it was stuff I already wanted to do, so I was having a freak out moment because I was a little sleepy still. Um, so the hot, the Manted High Council, that's how I'm referring to them, is so they are now in front of me. I didn't even know there was such a thing. So normally, oh, and actually, I'll take a step back. So I get in front of them, and the second I get in front of them, I start bawling, like, in real life. And I was like, what the heck is going on? Because it, it reminded me of when people, either when people pass away or when people have a near-death experience, and they finally see Jesus, and they just lose it. Because it's just, you're in front of you're exposed to so much love and your body just releases all this trauma like crazy just the moment it's around it. Um, So I'm like, why am I bawling? Like I've died, gone to heaven, and they've put me in front of Jesus. Like I literally wrote that down because I was like, what is happening here? My soul clearly recognizes things that I do not. Um. So I was like, okay, something's going on here and I'll figure it out eventually. Because in this lifetime, I've never seen this council before. So why am I freaking out? So I see Arlo, remember the silver mantid, that lovely creature. So I see him, he's part of the council, but that's not the reason I reacted like that. I don't cry when Arlo shows up. Arlo's here right now. <laughs> I'm not freaking out over him. Um, so, and then I also see this bronze colored mantid that's part of the council. And I was just like, what is that? No one told me there was this bronze color. What is that about? 
um, and I see that there is a golden mantid as their leader. So these mantids really stand out a lot because they're all wearing these um, like robes, I guess I'll call them. Normally when I see mantids, they have no clothes. There's no clothes. They're naked. <laughs> these mantids had like a like a long robe or cape all the way to the floor. Um, long, long sleeves covering their arms. Um, and so it just made it feel very official. Also, I was freaking out, crying. So something has to be a big deal about them. So I looked at the bronze mantid again. I just like, you know, I'm assessing the situation. I look over at the bronze one again. The bronze mantid has changed to like a violet color. Um, and so she is like this, she's iridescent and she's switching colors on purpose. And of course that fascinates me to no end. And I want to know what that is. So I say, these councils know how to draw me in. They know what I'm curious about. And clearly they dangle that information in front of me as an incentive for their contract. And so I'm looking at their orb. Their orb is really pretty. It's not just a clear orb. It has like white and green moving around inside of it. The golden mantid doesn't seem to speak at all. His communication is felt, but not really heard. This is the most primal of communication among us, an older form of communication. Even with telepathy, it normally translates into words but his communication does not. The sole contract he is proposing is precious to him. He presents it to me as if it is a person, almost. He opens the orb. So remember that orb with the white and green swirling inside of it. He touches it and opens it up. And so everything goes bright white for a second. And then the vision changes and we are somewhere else. So I'm in a, it looks like a bedroom or like a, it looks like a vacation house. It's a white room, white bed. There's these big windows. Um, windows are open. There's like a breeze blowing through the curtains. And then out the window is a coastline. It's a beach of some kind. And so I'm... I'm in there. I'm totally comfortable. I'm totally happy. There's a golden mantid in there with me. This one that I'm talking to. And he's hovering, but he's like, he's cross-legged, hovering, but he's like at the ceiling. He's really floating high. Um, so I realized after the fact, because I thought this was just some random vision, silly me, that I still think things are random. There's nothing random ever. About which guide is talking to you or what they're saying or what they're showing you. Nothing is random. I thought this was random. After the fact, I realized that I was being shown a place of significance in a past life with this golden mantid. I have not seen the lifetime, so I don't know what it was, but I recognize now that this was something very personal that I can't remember. Um, so he, the golden mantid comes down from his hovering position. And in this vision, he shows me another clear orb, but this one's like much smaller. It's like the size of an orange. And I laugh and I ask, okay, is this like a soul contract within a soul contract? Because the large orbs from the other vision represented soul contracts. So what's this little orb doing? And so he. I could feel his energy because they don't have facial expressions, remember, because they're mantids. They can move their antennae, but he wasn't. I just felt the energy off of him, and it just felt like smiling energy. So nice. And um, his name is Gideon, but I think I call him Geo. Um, and so he wants me, Gideon wants me to look at this orb. <laughs> he says, Geo. <laughs> He's correcting me. <laughs> so, um, 
So I see, when I look in the orb, I see, this is weird to explain. I see cosmic information. I see how the universe, and so I should explain this. What they are showing me in the orb is a general concept. I'm not seeing specific information. So what's in the orb is what they're offering to teach me about as part of the contract. So I look into the orb and I see that that would include cosmic information, such as how the universe works, universal laws, the history of the universe, magic of the universe. So that's what's being offered to me that I can channel from him. And so, of course, I'm tempted by that. Um, so I ask him how many books and I see the number three. <laughs> and so I'm like enamored with this golden mantid, right? Because he's given off of the world's best energy, just like Metatron. And so I look at him and I'm so I'm like, okay, because three books is a crazy amount, but he's got me in his like trance because of his energy. And so I'm like, okay, so you'll just, you'll channel it to me. I'll just write it down, right? Like that's all I have to do. <laughs> he smiles at me. And so when he smiles, I can feel it in my solar plexus, my solar plexus. And I start to cry again. And then that is my validation for me that this soul is, this is Jesus. This is Metatron. This is Metatron's soul that's in this golden mantid. And that's why he's touching my solar plexus the same way Metatron does. That's why I'm in his presence and I just start bawling. It's the same energy. Makes sense. So here's what I wrote down. I would do anything to spend time with his soul in any form on any planet. I have a sign in my house right now that says, and I choose you in a hundred lifetimes, in a hundred worlds, in any version of reality, I'd find you and I'd choose you. And that's what this is for me with him. And it is like this for all of you watching this. So not necessarily with Metatron, although it's entirely possible and I would be shocked, shocked if somebody could feel Metatron's energy and not want to follow after him with little hearts in their eyes. Um, but for all of you, there are certain souls and they are your guides who you are so enamored with and they are so enamored with you that it doesn't matter what the task is or what the lifetime is doesn't matter what bodies you have um doesn't matter how we get to interact with each other it's like um romantic relationship or parent child or siblings or what like it doesn't matter we are so eager to spend time with that soul again we are so eager to have one more lifetime with them or one more experience with them that the answer is always yes. Yes. Yes, let's incarnate again. Yes. And so that is that's what I'm that's what he's doing with me. He's like, "You want to you want to do a soul contract?" I'm like, "You know I want to do a soul contract. Of course I want to give me a 100 soul contracts. That's great." Like it's just the it's the dynamic. Okay. So as soon as I know it's him, it's like I don't I don't care what this contract is about. I want this contract. So I pull out of the vision. <laughs> and so I leave the beach and uh, I'm back in front of the Mantid High Council and I just stick my hand in the orb. I'm like, all right, I don't care what this is about. I'll do it. I asked Metatron what happened afterwards. Um, I was asking him, what happened that I would cry like that to see him again in that form? What happened? And he said that in that mantid lifetime, that golden mantid lifetime for him, he was my spiritual teacher and he died unexpectedly and I grieved the loss of him very badly. He makes me feel like it was similar to his lifetime with Jesus. I mean, what he's describing is 
the same thing, right? Spiritual teacher died unexpectedly. And then anyone who knew Jesus grieved incredibly. Oh my God, I cry right now. Don't let me cry right now, guys. Anyone who knew Jesus in that lifetime and, you know, and then he passed away. Of course, they grieved horribly when he was gone. Um, and I was uh, there w with Jesus in that lifetime, so I have a reaction to it now. Um, so that would explain, again, why I'm making that association when I was crying. And I was like, oh, it's just like you're dead and you are you finally get to see Jesus again. It was the same thing. It was like my spiritual teacher who I loved, who was taken from me too soon, I'm finally back in his presence. And so I bawled. Okay. So that's two orbs. We have seven. Um, the next one, I'm getting a vision of these blue whales, which remember from that book, that child's book I showed you, there was a whale. It was an orca, but in this case, it's blue whales. So I see blue whales and they're swimming in slow motion in the cosmos as if it were an ocean. This is the whale collective, an ancient energy that I've been wanting to know more about. No coincidences, right? So. I was kind of laughing about it because I'm like, Metatron, this isn't even work. You're just bringing me all the desires of my heart, <laughs> basically, and disguising it as a soul contract. So the message for everyone out there is that this is what it's like working with your guides. This is what it's like working with Metatron. This is what it's like working with God. They want to bring you the things that make you over the moon happy. They want to give you those things. And they, I don't know, they find ways to do it. Um, so let me see what I wrote. I said, they bring you things that make you joyful, that will benefit the world. He loves giving beautiful surprises because that's how God is. God loves surprises. And so a lot of times, especially now, I keep getting reminded of my first conversation that I had with God, which was essentially um, God saying, hey, I see, I see you want to help. I see you want to do something on the earth to help the earth, to help humanity. Tell me what you want and I will multiply it. That's what he told me. And I just said to him, I just want to help. And then I thought about it and I was like, I can spread messages. <laughs> this is before I could channel. I could spread, I can spread messages. And um, I guess I could channel because I could hear God. It's before it took, there was like two different phases to my channeling. It was like early channeling. I was using a lot of help from a lot of pendulums and letter boards. And then there was, I'm actually channeling on my own without equipment. So I kind of consider it two different phases. Um, but I just told him I can spread messages. And I said, you know, my heart surprise me, keep me busy. And I'll tell you what. <laughs> I'm surprised all the time. <laughs> First thing in the morning, <laughs> I'm absolutely crazy busy. So whatever you wish for, I make sure that's what you want because it's coming. It is definitely coming. Okay. So back to the whales. So I'm sitting on the back of a whale and it's like bumpy and it has these little um, like sea barnacles stuck to it like little shells and I'm just like we aren't done to the ocean we're up here in the sky what's going on <laughs> and so I look over to my right and instead of it being Metatron God is sitting with me and he extends his arm out with the floor she's like 
this is my original ocean. I'm just like, oh, okay. Complete with barnacles too. And so I'm looking around. I saw a jellyfish that again, it's like everything around us just looked like black sky with white stars, you know? It's just like a space background. And so we're riding on these whales. There's jellyfish. There's um the stars that are like the stars that were around us were like starfish. Like they were little. And they moved and they played and they had like child energy. The whales have a divine feminine energy, almost like a softer version of the dragons. So if the dragons are more like Lilith or Isis, then the whales are more like Mother Mary. They're, I didn't feel any darkness coming from the whales. They have a tiny bit of it, but it wasn't noticeable to me. I only felt like this nurturing love. And there was, this is crazy. And there was energy flowing in the cosmos that you could visually see as like a stream. And um, let me see what I said about it. There is an energy flowing through this part of the cosmos that acts like the current in an ocean, moving beings along. It really is just like an ocean, but calmer, safer, completely transparent. I ride on the back of this whale, and it's the perfect place for a heavenly rest. They dip up and down smoothly, slowly, rhythmically. Their song is smoother here, more of a frequency on a meditation track, and less of a squeal. If you've ever heard, I'm sure you have heard whales here on earth, the whale song, um, it's, it's a little more um, sharp. I'm sure that's the right word, but it's, um, it's more startling. In the cosmos, it's more like it was on, um, what planet was that? Sirius B, the water planet, where the whales were there, and their whale song set the frequency of the planet to keep it high. That sounded way smoother there on that planet, but the cosmos one, it didn't even sound like a whale at all. It sounds like... Like I said, like a like a meditation soundtrack. Like somebody's pushing the synthesizer, and these beautiful frequencies are coming out. Um, so then God left. He just he showed up for a quick second. Was like, this is my original ocean, and then he peaced out, and then it was Metatron again. So Metatron calls the whales timekeepers, and I'm like, I don't understand why because. Where we are in the cosmos is outside of time. Time is only on Earth, basically. Um, so he was trying to explain it to me, and it was taking me a second to understand. And so this is what I say. It's almost like whales are the metronome of the universe. Do you guys know what a metronome is? It's, um, huh, I don't even know if I know what a metronome is. It helps you keep the beat keep the pace in a song just like a heartbeat so the whales like the heartbeat of the universe um yeah keeping the beat keeping the pace keeping the heartbeat of the universe wow keeping the heartbeat of the universe i was like flipping out over that so Metatron says, as within, so without. So I need a heart inside of me, within me. So the universe needs a heart outside with it. Whale consciousness is the heart. And so when he's telling me that, it immediately triggers this like side conversation, this tangent where I'm asking him, okay, so what about unicorn energy? Because unicorn energy is a cosmic energy, the same way whale energy is. And so I'm like, 
does unicorn energy correspond with the chakra for the universe? And he's like, yes. He was all excited. Yes. The crown chakra for the unicorns. So the crown chakra of the universe is the is dictated by the energy of the unicorn collective. So then I was like, okay, you need to tell me all the chakras now. And so we had to sit down and I had to like try to channel correctly. So dragons, dragon energy is like the cosmic solar plexus energy. Um the sea turtles. Remember that remember that card? The sea turtles have their own energy, have their own collective, which I had no idea. And he was telling me that they are like the cosmic third eye energy of the universe. Um, let me just go down the chakras and give it to you in order. So I kid you not. I mean, somebody's going to have to double check me on this or I'm going to have to get more information on these. But this is to the best of my ability what I got. So your stellar gateway, which is two chakras above your head. Jellyfish. Jellyfish energy. Jellyfish collective. So I'm going to check that out. Um, your soul star. Pegasus energy. Crown chakra. Unicorn. Sea turtle. Sea dragon, which is what he was telling me this was. He's like, that's not a seahorse. You guys call it a seahorse. We call it a sea dragon. So that, like, when he said sea dragon, I was like so... I, I just had so much internal validation with that. And I was just like, oh, yeah, this is this is happening. And not that long ago, my business partner... She bought some crystals, and a lot of times when you buy crystals online, the seller will just send you something for free. And the seller sent her uh, like a little statue of a seahorse, and she sh was like, oh, I got a statue of a seahorse. And Metatron was like, no, water dragon, sea dragon, yeah. Um, so sea dragon energy, heart chakra is whale, solar plexus is dragon. Your sacral is phoenix, phoenix energy. Your root chakra is a nine-tailed fox, or I think it's also called a kitsune. And your earth star chakra, remember when I would tell you guys about my guides that I still have, my lions with the wings that protect me, that go with me to the astral realm? There's a name for these in Chinese culture, and I didn't know that. So it's I'm going to pronounce it wrong. It's P-I-X-I-U. Pishu. Pizu. I don't know. Anyways, that's the name that they have for lions with wings. And so that is the first time I've come across the correct identification of these. Because other people were like, oh, it's a griffin. It's a griffin. I'm like, no, griffins are like half eagle. This is like all lion with just wings. So anyways, that's the earth star chakra is the lion with the wings. Okay, so back to whales. I'm like, what kind of contract did these whales want? The answer comes as a download. I know they want to work with sound, with certain frequencies. They want to work with me to make music. And they show me my singing bowls. And they want me to do, I was like, one video? And they're like, two videos. And I was like, oh, okay. And um, I'm not a musician. So that's the kind, that's. It's ask, I'm not going to say it's asking a lot of me, but it's uh, it's outside of my natural talent set. I'll say that. And so there was more to the contract, which I cannot remember right now. I kid you not. But I'm always in like a trance practically when they do these things to me. Um, but there was other parts of the contract and I was like, no, no. And I rejected most of the contract. And um, so they modified it to just be... Basically, I'm gonna. I may, I have a contract to make some videos for you guys using the singing bowls, which I think is cool. And I'll have to figure that out. And so I stuck my hand in the orb, and that was that. The next group 
I, I knew what it was. I just said, like it came out of my mouth. I was, I said, Pegasus. And as soon as I said it, I got chills. And so I was like, this is going to be so easy because I'm madly in love with the Pegasus collective, like no other. So an opportunity to learn more about them is my dream. Um, Michael, Archangel Michael gifted me a black one a long time ago, long time ago. And he has a really beautiful, really beautiful white one that has the nose of his white one is just a little bit gray. Um, and I adore her and he will not let me ride her. That's like his baby that he doesn't let anyone else ride, but he uses her when he goes to the astral realm. So I get to see her a bit. Um, anyways, so I'm told that Michael will join me on this project, even though I'm going to be channeling their collective. And so Michael, Archangel Michael is one of those souls, just like Metatron to me, where I'm like, I don't really care what we're doing. I would like to do that with you, whatever it is. So I'm like, okay, let's do it. Um, ready to sign. So Michael shows me that I would be told much more about them, their history, their purpose, their planets. The contract is to spread the information that I channel on YouTube and on Medium, which is something that I would have done anyways. It's like not even a contract to me. <laughs> I'm like, that's fine. It's a contract when it's like a book that's like, oh, that's, that's work. Putting it on YouTube. I'm like, I can do that. Next contract, Ashtar, Commander Ashtar appears. He's in his elven clothing. His little elven ears that he hides from the world. Um, and so I'm like, oh, well, of course you're going to say you want me to write a book about Gana, the blue printer planet. I've been, that's like actually a life goal of mine is to write a really comprehensive book on that planet because somebody needs to write it and I can do that. Um, and so he's telling me, no, 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 it's not going to be, you're not going to say it's about Gana. You're, it, this is going to be a book about the elven people. And I was like, Really? Just the elf, the elves? That's it? It's like, yes. Of course, inadvertently, you would have to tell the story of all the other races they interact with in their home. Um, but he's like, he was showing me, he's like, people want to learn about the elven races. Nobody knows what Gana is. Nobody knows what the blue printer planet is. And I was like, oh, yeah, okay. You guys are better marketing. <laughs> you guys are better at marketing than I am. I'm just channeling, okay? <laughs> So he says one book, and I'm like, all right. So I agree to that contract. So now there is a council of the Greys before me. The Greys, they probably hate being called that. He says, no, we don't hate being called that. But you like, do you love it? No. You prefer Zeta Reticuli, don't you? Okay. I'm going to try to correct myself on that. I know a lot of people don't know what Zeta Reticuli is, but it's the, the, the gray aliens that we're used to seeing in all our scary movies and books and all that. Um, so their council, it's seven of them. They are wearing black robes. The, the leader, the one in the center, his black robe, he's like popped a collar. It's like, it's stiff and it's like up around his face like this. Um, and there's gold threading on these robes and I started freaking out because when I saw this leader I mean in my defense they look identical to me but when I saw him I recognized him as the one I have seen before um so I think I feel like I've told this story before but in case I haven't My entry point into the spiritual world was through a Reiki session that I didn't even know if it was going to do anything. I had no idea. I had one session of Reiki. During the Reiki session, I had visions for the first time in my life. I lost my mind. I became obsessed with having more visions. And so every night I would meditate desperately trying to get visions again so I could learn more about what the spiritual world was through my visions. Um, and I got my wish. And so I ended up 
having a vision where I saw like an angel and I saw like a demon. And then from the top appears probably from here up, just, just the head, basically shoulders up, appears a gray. And it's this gray. It's this Zeta Reticuli being that I saw. And as soon as I saw him in my dream, I'm like, um, in my dream, in my vision, like internally, I'm freaking out. But in the meditation, I'm like, okay, be chill, be cool, just be cool, just relax, which is funny because all of these spiritual beings can hear our thoughts. So it's so embarrassing in hindsight <laughs> to think about what I said or thought. Um, but so I had that vision. After that vision, I must have been going through like an ego death or a midlife crisis or something because I was flipping out that not only was I, did I just find out that Reiki was a real legitimate thing, I just found out that like color therapy is a real legitimate thing. And um, that yes, there are angels and yes, there are demons, which I kind of thought anyways, but but the fact that it was like, yes, aliens are real. That really messed with me for a really long time because um, I I tried not to think about it because my only exper experience with aliens was like watching Independence Day or um, Signs and the aliens are scary, right? And so we're trained to be scared of these extraterrestrial beings. Um, and so I feared them. So my whole life, if anyone ever said, oh, are aliens real? And I'm like, well, gosh, I hope not, because that would be my ultimate fear is like a bunch of aliens coming to take over the planet, right? So I see this alien. So I kind of, it took me a long time to adjust to the fact that, okay, they exist. They're real. And every time I would be shown them in subsequent visions, I would panic. And so they would get pulled from my vision because I would panic every time I would see them. Um, yeah, so so when I realized that this being in front of me was the one from way, way, way long ago, it was this being that tried to reach out to me so long ago, and here he is now, and I'm finally not scared of him. I was like, wow, I'm really eager to see what he has to say. And so this is what I say. Everyone knows them as the frightening ones, as the ones that abduct humans against their will. They've left the human race with some trauma. It does need explaining. I need to talk to the leader. And so when I say that, he moves closer to me. And he's real close to me, so I can really see his face. And he's got these big black eyes. And I see that they actually do move a little. It's hard to tell because they're all black everywhere. Um, and so this is what I'm told. The abductions were against Galactic Council law. I was one of the ones abducted. That is why my fears run so deep with this group. The ones who abducted humans were rogue groups of Zeta Reticuli. They were collecting DNA samples from humans to assess what galactic groups we were made from. And they were trying to determine how they might stop our DNA from activating. These rogue groups worked under the cyborgs. The Zeta Reticuli leader is here now. So he was kneeling next to me and he triggered basically the memories of being abducted. And so he's like, has his hand on my face and he's trying to be like sweet with me. <sighs> and so I asked, I was trying to like not think about the trauma. <laughs> That's the right way to deal with it, right? I tell you guys to, to think about yours and mine. I'm like, I'll think about this later. <laughs> And so I asked him what his name was, and he telepathically shows me these symbols that I have never seen before. I'm sure I'll never see it again, unlike anything from Earth. And I ask him, I'm like, well, 
is there a name that you want to go by that like I'll be able to say? And he chooses Henry with an I at the end. H-E-N-R-I. I should call him Henri, like the French name. Um, and so then he puts his hand on my solar plexus and he's healing some of that trauma from the abductions for me. So the contract with him is to obtain information about their planet, their race, and most importantly, the abductions. So this is going to be a book that is a, all about the abductions. Who did it? Why they did it? All, all the details on it. And to relay that... They say through YouTube, Medium, or in a book. I feel very strongly that this is a book, to be honest. So I signed the contract, and I bowed to him. He bowed to me. And then before I meet the last group, I'm told in advance that the next soul contract is to make a book about galactic implants including why they happen, who gives them, and just a ton of detail on them. Now, I'm sure, I think most of you know, maybe you don't, I don't know. Right now through my business, Orange Light Energy, we have a service for galactic implant removal. We just put this service out. We just got bombarded with the information from our guides for how to do this, how to remove implants. And it's going to be really important to remove some of these barriers that are keeping us in a lower vibration. Well, so I'm being told that I'm going to write a book on it. So it doesn't seem far-fetched at all because I'm already starting to download a lot of information on it. So I see one of those hammerhead shark ETs, which is called a Barozian, B-A-R-O-Z-I-A-N. And so I'm looking at this being and they have these beautiful bluish white dots along the side of their body on both sides. Um, and so there's just these glowing dots on both sides. And for this one, I also saw like this pink lip, like a really skinny stripe of pink, light pink that was going along next to the dots. And so I asked Metatron, is this like a different race from the other ones that I've seen? And he says, no. And then I realized the pink on this shark, as I will call it, this Barosian, is an indicator of their heart energy. So your, your heart energy is a green color, right? Your heart chakra. But your higher heart, that no one ever talks about, is a pink color, a light pink color. And so it's associated with that. So the Barosian that I'm seeing now in front of me has all of their divine energy intact. Um, let me make sure I say this correctly. The Barosians who have chosen a lower vibration, like the ones who come and attack me and give me implants in my head. Um, so those ones have lost their higher heart energy. So that's why the ones that attack me don't have the pink stripe. The Barosians who attack me have lost their divine feminine energy as well. They have polluted their divine masculine to a toxic masculine energy. Here, with this new Barosian, I feel compassion coming from him. I feel tenderness. And I say to Metatron, does he feel bad that his race like regularly gives me implants? And Metatron didn't even need to answer because I could feel the energy off of this being. And he, I just felt his pain. He was just, he felt pained at the decisions of others from his planet. And so I told him, oh, I was like, okay, I need to talk to this guy. So I said, I'm Jennifer. What's your name? And I hear this audible attempt at speaking. Um, 
which was sweet because they were doing it for my benefit because they normally speak telepathically. And so he was just trying to verbalize for me, but it was really hard to hear. So we ended up just sticking with telepathic communication. Um, and so the shark's name is El Zabor, E L Z A B O R, El Zabor. When he, <laughs> he was funny, he was like validating questions for me by like touching my knees and stuff. And Metatron was telling me that he's going to be a permanent guide for me, which was pretty cool too. Um, Okay, so El Zabor is offering knowledge of his race and of all kinds of implants used on humanity. He is offering knowledge on all the races who put these implants into humans. And then I got emotional. Like, I felt like I wanted to cry. And I was picking up on his emotions. And he was showing me that these implants are a bigger deal than what humanity realizes of course but even a bigger deal than those of us who are aware of the implants can realize there are some ugly truths there it's darkness that needs to be brought to light to release it i see a lot of humans suffering this is the reason behind some things in humanity's past these are secrets of those in power. Everything done in darkness will be exposed before it can be experienced and released. And so I could see that the energy from it was that there was going to be some explosive information revealed in connection with these implants, ultimately, with the different kinds of implants over time and how that's affected the history of humanity over time. And so right away, I was like, huh, this seems like the kind of information that requires that I get a little bit more spiritual security, like a more security detail for myself. Um, and that's kind of me joking around. So I'm going to go serious with you guys for a quick second. But is I was, I was talking to Metatron and I was like, well, the Illuminati, who are ultimately controlled by the cyborgs, are not going to like this at all. Because this is exposing their secrets, basically. Or the cyborg secrets. Um, and I've been under special protections for a long time and you should have seen me when I first found out the Illuminati were real because I thought they were just a conspiracy theory or something found out they were real found out they could hear everyone's thoughts and I was like that's actually probably the only time that I got really scared and concerned and Metatron was like nothing's gonna happen to you nothing like he had to explain it to me but he's like they, they cannot get you. This is not the lifetime that they can get you. Let me see. So let me tell you this. For those of you who fear the Illuminati, this is not the lifetime. This is not the lifetime where we get killed off for speaking out. We've already done those lifetimes. This is the lifetime that the light wins and the truth is revealed and people can finally hear it and know it's true. There is a lot of trauma in us lightworkers. Trauma from all the other times, all the other lifetimes, we tried to save the world or just be ourselves, and the darkness came for us. We remember those traumas on a soul level, and it makes it hard sometimes to be our true selves or really put ourselves out there. So if you feel this way, if you're fearful about putting your whole self out there, um, or if you're fearful about speaking out against someone who's doing something wrong, then there is trauma that is still there in you that needs to be cleared so that you can have your full expression in this lifetime. So this is one of the reasons that we are all incarnated right now. We came to free other people. Yeah, 
Yes, yes, yes. But we came to free ourselves first. We have all the tools now that we need to do that. We have the knowledge and we have the support. This is the lifetime where everything comes together. Freeing yourself shows the world that being imprisoned in in trauma is not the only way life can be. It doesn't have to be that way. So I ask Elzevor how many books, and he says one, but I'm feeling like there's a second book possible, but I'm like, okay. So I sign the contract. And so that is all taken care of. And I'm looking at my notes right now and I'm, I'm hesitating. I'm like, should I keep going? Cause this is already a really long video. And I'm trying to say to wrap it up. So I'm going to wrap it up. Um, so those are my seven contracts with these different groups. So some of these things you'll hear about sooner rather than later. I feel like the books are probably set to happen more like next year. But if you've stayed with this video until this point, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, and let me know in the comments if you guys like these super long videos or if you rather have the shorter ones that are a little bit less... Um, demanding of your time because I know at least for me it's easier to squeeze in a 20 minute video here and there versus like a one hour video so let me know what you guys think in the comments and I'll see you all next time bye bye